a look at section 1.2, which is titled Rainfall Discharge Relationships Within Drainage Basins. Now, we have discussed already the hydrological cycle, the water cycle. So let's talk a little bit about how discharge um, will affect the drainage basin, basically how, what's that relationship like. So we see the term river regime. Now the river regime is the annual variation in the flow of a river. Now this is highly influenced by climate, by the annual climate. Partly, if you think of, especially in winter areas, um, wintertime usually has a lot of glaciers, especially in some of the colder places around the globe. Now as these melt, these glaciers melt, we're going to have a high amount of melt water coming down from those mountains. So in these cases, we're going to have a high volume, a high discharge of water, and we're going to have um, a different variation, than, let's say, in the summertime in this particular area. In some areas of the world, we have different amounts of rainfall during maybe fall or winter months. Think of here in the summertime, we see an, a huge increase in, um, in rain and in precipitation in the summer months. So if we have a river close to us, we'd see a different variation in the flow of that river. That river regime um, overall looks a little bit different from other regimes in, uh, in let's say, in Colorado or around the globe. So other, um, other influences of a river regime include a mountain nature of precipitation, the soil and the rocks, especially porosity and permeability. So in Florida, we have a lot of limestone, which is pretty porous and allows a lot of water to travel through. This is what makes us have great aquifers here. In other parts of the world, however, the soil and the rocks are not as permeable or not as porous. Also, um, morphology and the area and the slope of this drainage basin will influence the river regime and the amount of and type of vegetation cover as well. So a lot of times we see these um, different streams and rivers actually flow because of the result of uh, overland runoff, maybe groundwater springs, certain lakes, and like I mentioned with climate, the meltwater in mountainous or subpolar environments. So the river regime is pretty much like the character or the annual variation of the flow of a river, which is very important. On your screen now, you actually will see a typical river regime hydrograph of various rivers around the world. So the term hydrograph, if you break it apart, the graph, hydro, water, it's basically like a water graph. And this is a chart or graph that displays information based upon some sort of water variable, such as discharge, or remember the volume, the amount of water, perhaps temperature, and other variations as well. So the two that you see on the screen, actually, we, I think both of these on the screen are discharge ones. So the top one is the river regime of the River Severn. And notice that on the bottom we have all the months of the year. So during each month, the discharge is actually recorded. Now this says it's the average monthly discharge. So January, then we have February, and notice it's going down towards the summer months, and then back up once we hit fall and back up towards the winter months. So if you knew exactly where Severn was, you might be able to sort of decide whether this was due to climate, some sort of uh, maybe some precipitation differences throughout the year. Um, it looks like here we have a high amount of precipitation in the uh, in the winter months, low amounts in the summer. So a hydrograph will sort of depend, uh, with the look of it, will depend upon what's going on with the river. Now in this big one you see many different types and notice the hydrographs can sort of look all sorts of different ways. Sometimes you get high highly variable ones, sometimes you get these really strong peaks in certain months. So it really behooves you to understand where the river is in order to understand what's going on in the graph. So from here we can make assumptions, but really we would need to know exactly where all of these places are to make specific um, 
ideas of what's going on in the hydrograph. And just to let you know, figures 1.7 and 1.8 in your textbook, pages 5 and 6, do show you some excellent examples of river regimes and hydrographs. So we can take hydrographs one step further and we can actually use them to track floods or storms. So a flood hydrograph is the same thing as a storm hydrograph. Now these hydrographs show the discharge variation of a river over a very short period of time. So unlike a typical hydrograph which shows you over the course of a full year, a flood hydrograph is something perhaps for a specific storm or one particular flood. Now you've seen the term base flow. Base flow is the main supply of water to a river before the storm, usually coming from groundwater. So if we take a look at our graphic here, notice down here at the bottom, I highlighted it a little bit darker in black. This is our base flow. This is what the river would look like during this time of year if there was no flood involved or a storm. So the base flow on a flood hydrograph is basically the normal, what would actually be happening. We also see something called quick flow. And again, another term, but if you break it down, it should be pretty easy for you to remember. Quick flow is just that overland flow, so it's flowing on the surface during a storm that reaches the river and it causes a quick rise in the water level. So quick flow really increases that water level pretty fast. We also see this as something called peak flow. And we're going to talk about peak flow in here in just a second. So if we take a look at this hydrograph here, this is our flood hydrograph for, for whatever river this happens to be. You're going to see that on the bottom you always have time. So time increases as you move to the right. Now usually on the left hand side going up we're going to see an increased rainfall and discharge. So an increase in rainfall amounts and discharge or the amount of the river that's actually flowing and that increases as we go up. You're always going to see this almost this like t tiny little graph within a graph and this is going to show your rainfall. What's really most important about this little graph within a graph is this peak rainfall. We want to know exactly the the highest peak, the largest amount of rainfall that happened during this particular graph or this storm. That is going to produce something called lag time. Lag time is very important because this is the time between your peak rainfall and your peak river discharge. So this peak discharge here and that's also important. So this lag time is basically what you have to prepare people um, let's say you have a lot of people along this river. Well, you know your peak rainfall. You can calculate your peak flow or your peak discharge. That lag time allows you a couple hours to maybe um, evacuate certain people from this particular riverside. We also see on this graph something called the rising limb. So that's basically the up portion of your graph. And we also see something called the recessional limb also known as the falling limb. It depends upon where you get the resource, um, which particular vocabulary term you'll hear. So you have to remember both the recessional limb or falling limb coming down. Now for flood hydrographs, we have a lot of factors, once again, that affect flood hydrographs. Now the precipi uh, precipitation type and intensity of course will affect what that flood hydrograph, hydrograph looks like. The previous soil moisture, let's say that there was a lot of already a lot of rain activity, precipitation activity, and so the soil is pretty moist as it is. So that's going to affect what your hydrograph looks like. The drainage density, basically again, is that water still sort of sitting around or is it able to be drained somewhere? the slope of land, the land use or urbanization. We're going to talk about that here in a little second. The temperature and evapotranspiration rate. So the higher the temperature, 
usually we have a higher transpiration and evapotranspiration rate. The drainage basin size and shape, so what the shape of the river channel actually looks like, that's important. How about the size? If it's a really large river, the drainage basin on that is going to be pretty large. Whereas if it's a smaller river, the size really probably won't matter too much for a large area. The porosity and permeability of the rock. Now this is something if you want to take a look at, make sure you understand what these terms mean. And the vegetation type. Remember we've heard a lot about that um, the hydrological cycle and um, all the effects that vegetation has on um, rainfall and how it intercepts some of that rainfall. Now urbanization, as I mentioned, definitely affects flood hydrographs. Urbanization in many areas actually takes a lot of that nice soil, turns it up, and creates cement on it. So it becomes like these uh, cement paradises, if you will concrete jungles. So unfortunately if we have these highly impermeable surfaces or concrete or cement then we're gonna have a lot more overland flow we're not going to have as much infiltration of that precipitation. So the more urbanized an area what we tend to see is a huge peak of that discharge so we see a, hard, a large peak flow or a large peak discharge and the lag time between the highest point of rainfall amount and that peak discharge is going to be much smaller which means that people will have maybe less time to evacuate their homes so more water will actually be on the surface than is able to be infiltrated so in this particular graph notice the blue line here this is an area before urbanization we don't see a large peak like we do in the darker graph of after urbanization. Notice we have this very steep rising limb here and then the, again we have this very steep recessional limb. So the hydrographs are definitely affected by different types of factors, urbanization being one of them.